I'm sure uh, most of you uh, were blessed over the Christmas season to watch the Netflix spectacular, The Christmas Prince. Everybody watched The Christmas Prince, I'm sure. It's fantastic. Uh, 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 everyone in Knoxville is still talking about it. I'm sure eventually, if you haven't seen it, you'll probably watch it this Advent season. And Christmas Prince, believe me, is going to replace It's a Wonderful Life as everyone's Christmas a spectacular special. But uh, I'm really sad. It doesn't feel like many of you know this movie. But here's the way this movie goes. Uh, it's, uh, the, the King of Aldova uh, has just died, and his son, the Crown Prince Richard, is supposed to be the king. Right? But, but Richard is kind of like torn within his soul because he loved his father. His father is this amazing man. And he thinks, could I actually be the king? Because my father is so great. And if I become the king, what if I fail? And he's coming to grips with that. And so he kind of goes into hiding. And he's trying to figure out, is he going to become the king or not? Well, there's this evil man. Surprise. And the evil man's name is Simon. And Simon is this power-hungry dude who wants to become the king. And so he is curious, is Richard going to become the king or not? So he's pressing Richard. He's like, you've got to make a decision because if you don't become the king, I'm going to be the co- become the king. And then he starts plotting and he starts scheming to try to figure out a way in which he can actually have a claim for the kingdom as opposed to Prince Richard's claim on the kingdom. And so it's really important for the Christmas prince who is going to become the actual king of Aldova, right? Because if there's going to be a good king that will set the stage for Aldova into the future, but if there is a bad king, what happens for Aldova? Destruction, terror, awful things, right? It will always, uh, right, it'll, it'll, what's the, what's the C.S. Lewis phrase about Christmas? Like, always... Always winter and no Christmas, right? There it is. It'll always be Christmas and no winter. But here's the deal. All these things about the Christmas prince and all the things about kings, right? These stories, they capture our hearts and they capture our imaginations because what we really long for is a good king. We long for someone who will actually rule the world in equity. We long for someone who will rule uh, with kindness and beauty. We long for someone who will rule and make the world right once again. And we feel it not just in epic movies like The Christmas Prince, which I'll obviously have not seen, and this is a, you know, sort of illustration. Uh, but, uh, but maybe, you know, in Return of the King, right, uh, in these battles... Uh, you know, from Middle Earth or maybe in, um, you know, Black Panther and the battle for Wakanda, who's going to be the great king and all those sorts of things. And these things capture our imaginations because we long for the king to come and set things right. Well, when we read the Bible, there's this theme that runs from the beginning, from Genesis all the way into the book of Revelation, this idea of the kingdom of God. And when you open the Bible, what we see is that God made the world and he's the king who rules over all things. But quickly his people turn away from him and they go and they do their own things. Right. And then God in his kindness is coming back to them and saying, look, I'll be your king. I'll be your king. And the people are saying, no, we'll take our own king. We'll take our own king. And you set up Israel and there's this nation and there's this kingdom. And then that kingdom begins to turn away from the great king and they walk their own ways. And then they're separated from the land in which God had given them and they go into exile and Then they eventually come back, and God's kind. He brings them back. They begin to rebuild the kingdom again, and then that kingdom fails again. It's like, where is this kingdom? When will things be right? And then we come to the New Testament. And you open the first page of the New Testament, and you're immediately bored in Matthew chapter 1 because it's just a list of names, right? It's a whole page of names. But if you stop and you pause and you listen to the names, what you begin to realize very quickly is that it is telling us that Jesus has come from the line of David, who was the king of Israel. Or to put it another way, he is the son of King David of the kingdom of God. And because Jesus is of the line of King David, Jesus is now the rightful heir to the kingdom of God. And he is the king who will come and rule and reign and make everything the way it's supposed to be. Then you flip over to the second book in the New Testament, and it's called Mark. And again, you read in chapter 1, verse 14, and it says that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
He's saying the kingdom of God is at hand. And so once again, we learn that Jesus is this king. And so then the response, right, that is called for in the Bible is that we would be a people who return to the king, that we would repent and believe the gospel. And what this means is the Bible is telling us very early on in the New Testament that the cosmic king Jesus has entered the world to restore things and to make everything right. And therefore, humanity is being called to return to him and to submit to his authority, to submit to his care, to submit to his love. And I think that this is really significant because we have all kind of run away from the king and we have gone after other kings. I mean, most of us in this room are Americans. We don't have physical, like, human kings. But we have these kings, these things that rule our lives, that are sovereign over us, things uh, that tell you how to live, things that begin to shape your life and tell you what's important. And for most of us, it's, it's concepts, like it's things like popularity. Or it's things like accomplishments, it's good grades. Uh, for some of you, it's morality and not getting in trouble. For others of you, it's just having a good time. For others of us, it's making money. For some of us, it's girls. Uh, for some of us, it's just boys. Uh, but we have these kings that are shaping and ruling our lives, telling us what to live for and what to love. And those things that are shaping your life, those things that are ordering your life, are the things that are telling you what to do. And they tell you where to sit in the lunchrooms. Uh, they tell you what jobs to pursue. They tell you uh, uh, what schools to apply to. They tell you what parties to attend. They tell you who to invite to your parties. Right? These things begin to rule and shape you. Because they have become your king. They are the things that are sovereign over you, moving you through the world. But when Jesus came into the world, we see in verse 14, he came, what? Proclaiming the gospel of God. He came proclaiming the gospel of God. I, I assume many of you, if you've been around Christianity for a season, uh, have heard the word gospel before, right? And you know that the gospel, it literally means uh, the good news. But the question is, what is it the good news of? And oftentimes when we think about the gospel, we, we think about it purely in religious terms. But originally the gospel was a political term. And it was a political term to say that there is a new king. Right? The good news was often used in which a king would be victorious in battle. And so what would happen is he would send his messengers out into the surrounding cities and the surrounding townships. And the messengers would go out and maybe they'd ring their bell. And uh, you know, they'd say, hear ye, hear ye. You know, king Jumanji, he is one. Right? And you now must submit to him because he is the new king. He's been victorious, he will rule, he will reign, he will love you, he will protect you, he will provide for you. He is the king. And so turn to him because he has been victorious and therefore you must follow him. Now why would you want to follow him? Why would we want to follow this king, Jesus? Well, as we look at this baptism that we just read, it tells us what kind of king he is, right? This baptism is right at the beginning to sort of give you a foretaste of who he is and what he will be like. That he is a king who identifies with his people. And he is a king who will renew the world. And so tonight we're just going to talk about these two things. That Jesus is the king. And he's a king, right, who identifies with his people. And he's a king who will renew the world. First, Jesus is a king who identifies with his people. Now think about where do kings live? They live in castles, right? And they live in castles, why? To be separated from people like us, right? And then they surround themselves with their servants so that they don't have to be bothered by the sufferings of this world, right? And so a king lives a life that is separate and distant from his people. But that is not the way of King Jesus. King Jesus is one who identifies with his people. Think about this image that's happening here in the passage. Jesus is being baptized. And this image of baptism is this symbol of sort of being washed clean of all of our sins. But when you read the Bible, here's what's fascinating. We learn that Jesus is not just a man, but he's God. 
and that Jesus is one who is without sin. And so there's fundamentally this question, like, why would Jesus go and be baptized if he has no sins, if he has nothing to be cleansed of, nothing to be washed away? Why would he go into the water? I mean, if, if I was without sin, right, here's what my sin would be, right? I would stand up on the banks and I would make fun of everybody going down into the water. And I'd say, hey, I know what you did on Saturday. Get in the water. Get between the toes. It's filthy. But, you know, like, shame is your ears. They're filthy. Right? I'd be making fun of everybody, talking about how warm it is up in the sun while they're going down into the water. I would mock them right, and make fun of them. That is not what Jesus does. Jesus in his purity and in his holiness and his goodness goes down into the water with the people in order to identify with us. You know, oftentimes Jesus, when Jesus is brought up, you probably feel just a lot of shame. Maybe you feel a lot of guilt because that's what religion does to us. But Jesus didn't come into the world to mock us and to shame us. Right? Jesus came into the world in order to identify with us. And I think this is important. Jesus is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of you. You have brothers and sisters who might be ashamed of you. You have mothers and fathers who might be ashamed of you. You have friends who might be ashamed of you. You have spouses who might be ashamed of you. You have children who might be ashamed of you. But Jesus is not ashamed of you. But he draws near to you and identifies with you. And I think that this is one of the things that makes Jesus' kingship utterly unique. Because almost every other king uh, demands that you are successful and that you are getting the job done. I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, people begin to avoid you when you fail. When, when the girl doesn't think you're attractive, you don't get the date. When you lose in the playoffs, the season's over. When you mess up, you're sort of kicked out of the friend group. Right? I mean, when, when you break up with somebody, somebody has to be wrong, and then that destroys the whole friend group of everybody who is hanging out, right? And so we cast one another away. But Jesus is different. He delights to identify with his people, he desires to be near you. Now, think about what's going on in this imagery of the baptism, the people of God. They've been rebelling against him. They've been going their way, doing their own thing. They've been essentially giving God the bird. And John the Baptist is saying, repent, come back, come to the kingdom, right? And so they go to John the Baptist, they go out into the waters and they are washed, they're baptized, they're sacramentally having their sins washed away. And so what this means is that as they go down into the water and the water sort of poured over their heads or sprinkled or they're immersed, whatever's happening in this passage, right? Like their sins are being washed into the river. And so in a sense, Jesus isn't going into this sort of clean, fresh, pristine pool. Jesus is walking down into the pool of our sin. He's walking down into the pool of our own filth. And he's having our sins poured over him. When I had uh, little girls, uh, we used to bathe them together for efficiency. Uh, and uh, not actually for cleanliness. <laughs> because when you put two children in a bathtub together, what that means is what? They're sitting in each other's filth. Right? And there's like feces floating around, kind of around them. It's true. <laughs> if you've got a child, if you have multiple children, you put them in the bathtub together, that's what's in the pool. Right? That's what's it. Right? And then you give them cups. And you think, oh, these cups are going to be great. And they're like pouring like the filth over them. And that's what's happening to Jesus. Right? Our filth is being poured over him. I don't know... Uh, if y'all have seen, any of you seen the planet Earth? And by planet Earth, I mean, whoa, some, golly, holy Moses. Um, can we do something about this? Because, okay, fantastic, thank you. 
Uh, so where was I? Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever seen uh, the, the Planet Earth, right? The BBC nature show. Well, in Planet Earth, season two, episode Jungles, right? There's, there's this little frog, and it's called a tree frog. It's, it's not a tree frog. It's called a glass frog. And it's called a glass frog because you can see through it. It's this really fascinating thing. And so this frog hangs out on these sort of leaves over a creek and stuff like that. And it's hanging out there. And all the lady frog ladies, they think, I want to hang out with this frog. And so they come over and they like bring their eggs to him. Right? And then he just sort of fertilizes their eggs, however frogs fertilize eggs. And then he hangs out with them and the ladies leave. They leave him alone and he's there to take care of these eggs. Now, these, these glass frogs have one predator, and the predator is, does anybody remember? A wasp, right? And these wasps come, and they're looking for these frogs, and what they really like is the eggs, because they love little tadpole eggs. And so these, these wasps will fly over, they'll find the eggs, and they just stick their face in the eggs, and they slurp the tadpoles out, and all this sort of stuff. But the dad frog knows that wasps like to do this. And so the dad frog says, not today, wasp. And he climbs over, he actually climbs over the eggs. And the wasp sees through him and sees the eggs. And then the wasp starts stinging and trying to eat the daddy frog. And so then frog legs, right, start like flapping and hitting and defending his eggs from the wasp, right? And what he's doing is he's identifying with his children and he's protecting them so that they might have life. And that is what Jesus is doing by identifying with us. He is identifying with us in order to protect us, in order to give us life. Right? The baptism of Jesus is a foreshadowing of what will happen at the end of his life when he goes to the cross. Because it's at the cross that all of our sins then are poured out upon him. All of them. All those things that you hate about yourself. All those things that you've done that you're ashamed of. Like, we don't have to name them all. Lying, uh, cheating, stealing, uh, you know, making out. Uh, formal, uh, whatever it would be. All those things that make you feel unclean, those secret things, they're poured out upon Jesus so that you might be preserved, washed clean, protected, given new life. The king identifies with his people. But the king also makes all things new. If you're like me, uh, when you look at the world, it's pretty beautiful. I mean, the amount of colors are glorious. Uh, the amount of different flavors. I mean, cinnamon, right? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Pumpkin spice latte, amazing, right? This is, tis, tis the season, that's all I'm saying, right? I don't know if you know this or not, but I learned today that Frosted Flakes is making a pumpkin spice Frosted Flake. Fantastic. And you know, who, and, and Cheerios followed suit. I don't know, anyway. Just so you know, anyway, think about flavors, right? It's a beautiful world. But at the same time, right, as we experience all the beauty of this world, it's also a mess. Uh, we think about uh, the things that we experienced this week in D.C., conversations on sexual assault. Not just the conversations about sexual assault. Many of us men and women have been sexually assaulted. We've been triggered all week by the conversations of the things that have happened to us in the past. And you think about the world and you have these broken hearts. You watch the news and we see school shootings. We experience and participate in racism. There's just sickness, sorrow, pain, and death that have entered into this beautiful world. And we can't change it. We can't fix it. And what we're longing for is someone to do that. And what I want you to see in verse 10 is that the heavens open up and the Spirit is then descending on Jesus like a dove. 
And that's an incredibly strange verse, but it's a very uh, important image. Because what's happening in this image is that it is telling us that Jesus is going to be the beginning of a new creation. Now, how do we see this? Well, think back to the beginning of the Bible. It begins in Genesis. And the way the Bible begins starts in the beginning. It's pretty great. If you're going to start, just start in the beginning. Uh, so in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And when God made the heavens and the earth, he made everything good. He made it very good. Humanity was in a right relationship with ourselves, right? We were in a right relationship with God. We're in a right relationship with one another. We're in a right relationship with the world. And God is serving as king, and we're his servants, his vice regents, ruling over his creation on his behalf. But humanity said, we only do that. Right? And we rebelled. We went our own way. And by going our own way, wickedness, evil kind of came into the world, sadness, tears. And that broke God's heart. And so we're on page three of the Bible at this point. And then uh, he gets to page six. And God's like, I'm kind of tired of this. And so he tells a guy named Noah, hey, why don't you build a boat? Because it's going to rain for a while. Right? And the rain comes down, 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 down. Right? And, the, and the rain was to cleanse the world, to be a baptism of the world, to cleanse it. Right, to make it right. And through that, he saves Noah. And the rain stop. They begin to recede. The boat probably, presumably, lands on a mountain. Some people think in Turkey. Uh, there's a YouTube about it. Uh, <laughs> must be true. Uh, everything on YouTube is true. Uh, so anyway, it's a, so it, it gets, the, the rain stops. Noah comes out on the deck. He's got a dove, and he lets the dove go, and the dove kind of flies around, and it comes back. Didn't have anywhere to land, right? The creation's been kind of wiped out. Seven days later, it takes the dove, lets the dove fly around, right? The dove flies around. It has a little olive branch in its mouth, but it comes back. Presumably, what's happening now, right? The, the, the vegetation is growing, but it couldn't find a place to land still. Seven days later, he sends the dove back out again, and it doesn't come back. Presumably because the dove has found a place to land on the new creation. Now, you read through the Bible, right? And you're like, Where? you don't see the dove again until here. At Jesus' baptism, this dove comes down to land upon Jesus as if to say God's judgment and cleansing has come. And this Jesus, this King, is the beginning of a new creation. It's not just what they see in this dove, but it's also what they hear, right? Jesus goes down on the water, comes up, heavens are open, the Spirit comes down like a dove, and then there's this voice, verse 11. A voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, with you I'm well pleased. Oh, you are my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, what does this mean? When you read through the Old Testament, uh, this phrase, Son of God, is repeated a few times and attributed to different people. And so the Son of God is attributed to Adam, the first man in the Bible. Uh, it's attributed to Israel, the children, the sons of God, the people of God. And it's attributed to the kings, who were the sons of God. And they were all supposed to be representatives being the children of God, those who would follow after the Father, who would represent God as king to the world. And what is true of all of them is that they all failed. Right? Adam ate the fruit. Uh, Israel uh, stopped listening to God. They worshiped false gods. They oppressed the poor. The kings rejected God, and they spent their lives going to war and accumulating wealth and power when they were supposed to be caring for and preserving and protecting God's people. And what we see as we read the Bible is that all of God's sons, his kings, his nation, his child, they all failed. And this is what makes the declaration pretty amazing because Jesus isn't just a son of God like Adam and the kings, but Jesus is the son of God in whom God is well pleased. 
And what this means is that Jesus is the son that we were all supposed to be. Jesus was successful where we failed. He was faithful where we were not. And if we're honest, we've all done terrible things that we hate. And we've all done things that we wish we'd never have done. We've all done things that when we're older, we're going to lament. And we've all been failed by others. But not by Jesus. And so at Jesus' baptism, God is declaring Jesus to be the Son and the King. Who has come faithfully. And who has come to make everything right. He's come to undo injustice. He's come to wipe all tears. And notice what Jesus does immediately after the baptism. Verse 12. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Uh, it's easy to read it and just go, okay, he went out into the wilderness. It's cool, right? This is amazing because, you know, if, if any of you have ever had a ba- been baptized, and you usually sort of go to the Golden Corral, you know, after church with all your friends and family, you have a party, you know, but Jesus doesn't do that. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't go out to get the soft serve. He doesn't get in a limo and go off and ride into paradise. Uh, he goes out into the wilderness. And the wilderness in the Bible is the place outside of the garden. The wilderness in the Bible is the place where God's people get lost because of their rebellion. It's a small detail, but it's incredibly important. That Jesus as the king goes into the wilderness in order to rescue us. That Jesus goes out into a sinful, broken, lonely world and he suffers in it in order to restore his people and his kingdom. And to make it all the way it's supposed to be. Think about the live action Beauty and the Beast. Has anybody seen this? Okay, now we're on. Okay, good. All right. So the live action Beauty and the Beast, it's a tale as old as time. We know that. Uh, but, uh, but so what happens is the Beast, right, who was once this beautiful, powerful prince, uh, is also mean and cruel. And so Agatha, right, or the good witch, uh, she comes in the midst of a storm looking for a place of refuge. And when the beautiful prince sees her, he's like, you're ugly. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> Leave my castle, right? And, and because of his cruelness, this curse sort of rests upon him. And this beautiful human becomes this hideous beast, by the way. Right? And, uh, and then the castle, what happens to the castle? It begins, it starts to crumble, right? It's always falling apart. Somebody needs to do something, right? And then the servants, the friends, right? They become slaves and they lose their humanity. And then uh, what happens? You've seen it, maybe. If you haven't, I'm going to ruin it for you. But it's, you've had enough time to see Beauty and the Beast. Uh, the bell, the beautiful bell. She, she, she's brought out into the wilderness. Into the cold, into the loneliness, into the fearful place where the wolves are chasing her, right? And she enters in and she lives this life, this beautiful life of love before the beast and before the servants and in this crumbling kingdom. And because of her love and because of her beautiful life, because of her care, because she begins to identify with the beast, she begins to love the beast, right? The curse is reversed, And the beast becomes a human again, right? The servants uh, become friends. They become humans. The castle, like, magically is put back together. And then what's amazing is, like, the castle had been hidden. Nobody had ever seen it. They'd forgotten that something glorious and beautiful was even out there. And And then the surrounding villages, they see the castle, and they're brought in. And, the, and then there's a dance, right? And there's celebration. 
Because someone has done something beautiful. Because someone has entered into a lonely and broken world and begun to love. And that's what Jesus, our King, has done. He's left the glories of heaven. He's entered the wilderness of this world. He's entered the loneliness and the suffering that is ours. And he has loved us. He's drawn near to us. He has provided for us. He has borne our sin. He's borne our suffering. He's borne our brokenness with this great promise of his love and his care. And we're living in the midst of this. As it's slowly being rebuilt until the great day of his return, when there will be the celebration that the king has come back. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you have not left us. You've drawn near to us. You've not abandoned us, but you've loved us. Father, we thank you that you are a good king. And we pray that by your spirit, you would enable us to return to you with great love and affection that we might follow you and follow your ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.